This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. In these podcasts, we uncover one chapter after another from the life of the Prophet wasallam in an attempt to learn about him, to love him, and to better ourselves through his example. Immersion, mentorship, companionship, and tarbiyah. These are just a few of the things we offer alongside knowledge of the prophetic biography at the Sira Intensive. Two weeks dedicated to the study of the life of the Prophet wasallam and his noble characteristics. So this winter, join me in Dallas, Texas, alongside your classmates from all over the world to learn the story of the life of the best of humanity, the ultimate mercy to mankind, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bismillahi wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah, continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as to Nabawiyyah, the prophetic biography. In the previous session, we kind of left off in the middle of the discussion about the battle of Uhud. So as I mentioned previously that everything that happened post Badr was basically pre-Uhud. So everything that transpired was not only a reaction and impacted by the battle of Badr, but it was also what contributed and what led and built up to the battle of Uhud. And so in the previous session we talked about um, the Prophet ﷺ finding about the army of Quraysh marching towards Medina, the Prophet ﷺ um, you know, uh, seeking out counsel and advice from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, from the companions, uh, may Allah be pleased with them. And finally, the Prophet ﷺ amassing about a thousand individuals and heading outside of Medina, right outside of Medina to the Mount of Uhud, and basically preparing to meet the army there. And at that particular point in time, Abdullah ibn Ubay bin Sulul, who was the leader of the Munafiqun, he takes 300 of his allies and retreats back from there, kind of trying to leave. You know, he complains that, oh, you know, Muhammad doesn't listen to me, and so on and so forth. But really at the end of the day, his whole point and objective was to try to delude the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims that, look, you have a thousand people, and then try to leave them high and dry, you know, minus a third of the army. But of course, the Prophet ﷺ wasn't bothered by that, as the Prophet ﷺ had already told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum at Badr, that, you know, we don't fight based on numbers, but we fight with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now at this particular point in time, they're set up there. We also talked about the fact that um, two of the tribes of the Ansar, you know, kind of contemplated and thought about leaving when the Munafiqun le- left as well. But, uh, but then they, you know, realized what a, what a mistake that would be. And they stood firm and they went ahead and they stayed with the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about this in the Qur'an. إِذْ هَمَّتْ طَائِفَتَانِ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ تَفْشَلَا وَاللَّهُ وَلِيُّهُمَا وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكَلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ That when two groups from amongst you thought about retreating and leaving, they almost became defeated before even the battle started. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is their friend and their ally. And only upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do the believers continue to put their trust and their reliance. And so then they stood firm and so these 700 believers were now there ready to go. There's a very interesting incident that occurs at this particular time. As when they arrive there outside of Medina, there is an elderly man um, who lives out there and he was blind at this particular point. And he had this, for some strange reason, he had this very deep-seated hatred for the Prophet ﷺ. So when he heard the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims arriving there, he reached down and he grabbed أَنَّهُ أَخَذَ حَفْنَةً مِّن تُرَابٍ فِي يَدِهِ um, And he picked up some dirt in his hand. And he said at that time, وَاللَّهِ لَوْ أَعْلَمُ أَنِّي لَا أُصِيبُ بِهَا غَيْرَكِ يَا مُحَمَّدْ لَا بَرَبْتُ بِهَا وَجْهَكْ And he started picking up dirt and throwing it in the direction of the sound that he could hear of the Muslim army. And he was saying that I swear to God that if I knew that I could, you know, hit, smack this dirt against your face, O Muhammad, then I would have done so. But I'm blind, so I can't. 
So obviously somebody that's very offensive, he's being very um, belligerent and very disrespectful. فَابْتَدَرَ الْقَوْمْ لِيَقْتُلُوهُ So many of the people, they, the Sahaba became so upset and so perturbed that many of them started advancing towards him, you know, kind of putting their hands on their swords. They started advancing towards him that let's take care of this guy. How dare he speak this way to the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said at that particular time, لا تقتلوه, Do not kill him. فَهَذَا الْأَعْمَى أَعْمَى الْقَلْبِ أَعْمَى الْبَصَرِ Because the Prophet ﷺ said, this blind man is not only blind from his eyes, not only does he lack vision of the eyes, but he lacks the vision of the heart. He doesn't know any better. He's blind from his heart. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلَ بِصَارِ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلَ قُلُوبِ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ That real true blindness that is actually problematic is not the blindness of the eyes, but it's the blindness of the heart that, we, that is within the chest. And so the reason, uh, of course this happened at the time of Uhud, but the reason why uh, I wanted to mention this, and I think that we should take special note of this, is because the few incidents in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, like we talked about pre-Uhud, you had the incident of Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf, the half Arab, half Jewish um, poet and inciter of war, who basically single-handedly you know, created the fervor that led to the Battle of Uhud. That the Prophet ﷺ had him assassinated, he had him killed. Because he was instigating an entire war in which hundreds of people would lose their lives. And so much death and destruction would occur. And this one man was hell bent on making this war happen. Now what ends up happening with an incident like this is, this type of an incident is talked about, it's blogged about, uh, we're questioned about it non-stop, you know, where Muslims are taunted with it, they are constantly, you know, people try to back them into a corner with this type of an incident from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, even though it's completely justified if you know the context of it. But these types of incidents, they don't get talked about. And of course, the people who don't like us and the people who dislike us, they're not going to bring up incidents like this. But we have to be able to quote these incidents from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, every single time something tragic occurs somewhere in the world, recently we had the thing in France, where somebody, you know, depicts the Prophet ﷺ in a very disrespectful manner, and tries to mock the Prophet ﷺ in a cartoon or whatever it may be. And you know, somebody reacts, you know, um, somebody reacts irrationally and goes and you know, shoots up the whole neighborhood and tries to kill as many people, even killing a Muslim security guard and whatnot. So, you know, somebody behaves irrationally like this. Well, what we, and at that time, a lot of times there's a discourse and there's a dialogue within the Muslim community. So people who might be the very small minority, the very small vocal minority, that might be an advocate of such a course of action, they say, well, what about Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf? All the rest of you Muslims, you're not educated about your history. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ take out Ka'b ibn al-Ashraf? Yes, he did, but he instigated a war. He was instigating a war. But just simply the disrespect of the Prophet ﷺ, this old man is standing there cursing the Prophet ﷺ, throwing dirt and rocks in the direction of the Prophet ﷺ, saying, I would smack you on your face if I could see you. And when the Sahaba are willing to go and, you know, take care of him, the Prophet ﷺ actually says, no, 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 leave him, leave him. He's ignorant. He doesn't know any better. Like, you know, this is the exact realization of those, I, that idea and the expression that we use about taking the high road. Being the bigger man. You know, not stooping down to someone's level. This is from the life of the Prophet So it's very important that we know our history, we know our sirah, we know our deen. So that we have a proper understanding of our religion. Otherwise we, you know, it's the tragedy of our times. One of the greatest blessings of our times is also one of the greatest tragedy of our times. And the blessing of our time is, you know, we have all this technology and communication and network and internet, right? Information gets across the world in a matter of seconds, even less. You know, you can pretty much access any type of information. People always marvel at the fact you can pull up the Qur'an in like 37 translations of the Qur'an in the blink of an eye. You know, you can search through Bukhari and Muslim and Tirmidhi and Nasai, Abu Dawood and Ibn Majah. Like you can look up a hadith, right? There are entire text and fiqh and tafsir and hadith and everything online. 
But the problem is also, the tragedy is, is that we sometimes become so dialed in and so connected that the only source of our knowledge is basically whatever information is coming through to us that is on the surface. And what floats at the, uh, on the surface of the ocean? The foam does. The debris does. The Qur'an actually speaks about it. That the water is deep. And it's rich and it's beneficial and it's good. But on the surface you see all the debris and all the trash. Right? كَذَلِكَ يَضْرِبُ اللَّهُ الْحَقَّ وَالْبَاطِلِ So a lot of times the things that are just coming to us on the surface, the little six second clips, the tweets, the Facebook posts, whatever's running on whatever you know, media or news channel or whatever, right? Entertainment, Hollywood, this is all the trash that's on the surface. And there's even good knowledge over there, but the problem is we have to go and we have to access it. This lecture itself, right, is not only streamed live for anybody that wants to tune in, but this is basically put out on a podcast. But then I have to check myself that, am I actually going and reading a real book on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah? Am I actually going and listening to a podcast of a dars, of a class, that properly going to, through the sources talks about the life of the Prophet ﷺ? Or am I listening to the 30 second, 60 second, 2 minute clip that is the trash that's floating on the surface? Right, that is coming from people with their own agendas, whether they be from either end of the spectrum. The extremists that are trying to ruin Islam from internally, or the extremists that are trying to destroy Muslims ex- from externally. Right? So we have to really think about these things. So this blind man cursing the Prophet ﷺ, trying to physically assault the Prophet ﷺ, when the Sahaba tried to attack him, he says, no, no, leave him. He's ignorant, he's blind, meaning not blind. The Prophet ﷺ didn't mock him about being blind from his eyes. He said his heart is blind. His heart does not grasp and comprehend the truth. Anyways, moving forward from there, the Prophet of Allah وسلم, when they reached to the point of Uhud, and the Prophet وسلم, وَجَعَلَ ظَهْرَهُ وَعَسْكَرَهُ إِلَىٰ Uhud, the Prophet وسلم, put the mountain of Uhud to his back and to the back of the army. The Prophet وسلم, gave a few instructions. First and foremost, he said, لَا يُقَاتِلَنَّ أَحَدٌ حَتَّى نَأْمُرَهُ بِالْقِتَالِ That nobody should fight until and unless we give them the permission to fight. Nobody should fight unless they are given the permission, unless we give the permission to fight. So be very calm, be very relaxed. Yes, we are here to do a very difficult job, but this requires a lot of thought, a lot of patience, and a lot of stability. We have to be stable here. We're in the battlefield, it's going to get heated. But that never justifies us becoming irrational or unstable. So that was something very important. The next thing the Prophet of Allah وسلم, did was, he took 50 archers, and he appointed as a leader, Ammara ala rumati yawma idin Abdullah ibn Jubayr. Abdullah ibn Jubayr, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was an Ansari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam appointed him as a leader of 50 archers. And in fact, um, Abdullah ibn Jubayr, um, he was wearing white clothes on that day. And so that was kind of like a marker, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also pointed out that look for the white shirt. And that tells you that the archers are in place. And he appointed these 50 archers and he basically placed them there on the mountain. And he said, In dahil khayla anna bin nabil, la ya'tuna min khalfina, in kanat lana aw alayna fathbut makanak, la nu'ta yanna min qibalik. This is a hadith of Bukhari and Muslim. The Prophet ﷺ said, You stand here at the mountain and you guard us from behind. You watch our backs to make sure that they don't send the cavalry around the back from behind us so that they come and they kind of sandwich us and catch us in between. So you stand here and you protect us. You watch our backs for us. All right? And the Prophet ﷺ told them very clearly, and we're going to be revisiting this issue. The Prophet ﷺ said that even if in kanat lana, if we start to win the battle, أو علينا, or we seem to be losing the battle, فَثْبُتْ makanak. You stay where you are. You don't move from your post. You might be like, oh, it looks like they're, you know, kind of suffering some losses. Let's get down there and reinforce them. No, no, no. You stay in your place. Oh, they're winning. The battle's over. Everything's... No, you stay in your place. And the Prophet ﷺ says, so that we are not attacked from behind, from that side. You, that's your job. Now after the Prophet ﷺ had basically given these instructions, the next thing the Prophet of Allah ﷺ mentions about him is that, ظَهَرَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ بَيْنَ الدِّرَعَيْنِ 
يعني لبس درعا فوق درعين. The Prophet ﷺ wore two armors. He wore two layers of armor and protection. Now, the reason why that's relevant is that number one, the Prophet ﷺ expected the battle to be very, very difficult and very fierce, as indicated by the fact the Prophet ﷺ reinforced his own personal protection. Right. The second thing that it also tells you is that the Prophet ﷺ had every intention to be in the thick of it. We already talked about the Battle of Badr. If you go back and listen to the podcast, in the Battle of Badr, Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu describes the Prophet ﷺ running back and forth throughout the battlefield. To the front line, to the back, checking on everyone, back and forth, back and forth. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu is a young man, 20 something years old at this time. He says, I could not keep up with him. I could not. And the Prophet ﷺ is 50 something years old. And he says, I'm 20 something years old and I couldn't keep up with him. Right, so the Prophet ﷺ had every intention to be in the thick of it. And the third thing, so that's leadership, leading by example, leading personally. And the third thing that this also tells us, is that it shows us that it is a part of the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to take whatever precautions need to be taken, and are reasonable, within reason. It is very important to take precautions. Right, that it is not from tawakkul, it is not some type of religious concept or spiritual idea that you throw caution to the wind and basically, you know, um, let go of any type of precautionary measures. No, 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 but taking precautionary measures is from the sunnah. And then you have courage, and then you have willingness, and then you do what needs to be done, but you do practice a very high level of precaution. That is from the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The next thing that um, is narrated about the Battle of Uhud is that a group of young men, we'll call them, like teens, teenagers, younger teenagers, a group of young men, uh, they came to the Prophet ﷺ to participate in the Battle of Uhud. And the Prophet ﷺ, he turned them back. One of them, of course, famously was Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Who says in the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim, قَدْ عُدِتُ عَلَى النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمِ يَوْمَ أُحُدْ فَلَمْ يُجِزْنِي That I was presented before the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم to partake in the Battle of Badr, but he did not, uh, in the Battle of Uhud, excuse me, but he did not give me permission. وَعُدِتُ عَلَيْهِ يَوْمَ الْخَنْدَقْ وَأَنَا إِبْنُ خَمْسَ عَشَرَةَ فَأَجَازَنِي But then I was presented to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم on the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of the Trench, and he gave me permission. وكذلك, and some of the others whom the Prophet ﷺ turned back because he felt that they were too young because of their tender age were Usama ibn Zayd, Zayd ibn Thabit, Barra ibn Azib, Usaid ibn Zuhair, Araba ibn Aus, ibn Qaydi, um, and others. So all of them were basically turned back because they were too young. But you know what? One thing that's very remarkable, and again, this, there's a profound lesson here. One thing that's very remarkable about this list, if you go through it again, Abdullah ibn Umar, Usama ibn Zayd, Zayd ibn Thabit, Barra ibn Azib, right? When you go through this list, what you realize is that these eventually would become some of the most knowledgeable of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And they would take, participate in battles later. But they all became amongst the most knowledgeable of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So what this tells you is that, that they... You know, there was a system in place, there was a, generally speaking, in terms of a society and a community, that there was a culture in place that even if you couldn't do one thing, that there was still something else for you to do. That you weren't rendered useless. There were many different things that needed to be done. So if they couldn't participate in the battle, then they could be learning the Qur'an, they could be learning the ahadith, they could be learning their religion. And these would become the teachers of the next generation. And that also tells you about the Prophet ﷺ, that he encouraged them, that okay, you might be young right now, where you can't participate in the battle, but what you can be doing is learning your deen and your religion. And this also tells you about these young men, that they didn't use this as an excuse. Well, I wanted to go in the battle, and you didn't let me, so then that's that. And I'm not going to do anything else. No, you sit down, no, no I'm not going to learn Qur'an. I want to go to the battle. Right? That type of entitlement and spoiled attitude that a lot of times we end up having. Right? Um, so that wasn't present there in, that, in, their, in the culture of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. If you can't go to the battle, you can sit down and memorize the Qur'an. 
But that is also a need. And of course, Surah Tawbah talks about it. وَمَا كَانَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَ فَلَوْ لَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ That even if a time and a situation came like you did at Tabuk, where every single person has to go out into the battle, and everyone had to participate, a group should still stay behind to continue to learn the deen, so that when they come back to them, إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَحْذَرُونَ so that there is someone to teach them when they do come back from the battle. And there's somebody to continue the message and the deen on forward. The da'wah and the education can continue. The next thing that's also mentioned is that it also shows the eagerness of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum. You know, youth is a very beautiful thing, a very remarkable thing, and you know, dare I say, even a really miraculous thing. What young people are able to do and accomplish is oftentimes very astounding. The energy, the ingenuity, the creativity of young people is remarkable, right? And that hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. Young people are just as energetic and just as enthusiastic and just as creative, right? Today as they were back in that day. But the difference is a lot of times, you know, at a particular place in time is what do you apply it to? They applied it to the deen. They applied it to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What do we apply it to? So it's actually mentioned about Samura bin Jundub and Rafi' bin Khadij. Samura bin Jundub and Rafi' bin Khadij, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, these were also two young sahaba, who initially the Prophet ﷺ had turned them back. He said, no, you're too young to participate. So somebody told the Prophet ﷺ that Rafi' is an expert archer. Like his archery skills are remarkable. He's a better archer than most of the men. And he demonstrated for the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ was so impressed with him that he said, okay, fine, فَأَجَازَهُ He said, you can come. And so then at that time, Samura bin Jundub radiallahu ta'ala anhu tells the Prophet ﷺ, well, if you're gonna let Rafi'ah go, well, guess what? I'm a much more skilled fighter than Rafi'ah is. And they actually, to demonstrate his um, skill as a fighter, he wrestled Rafi'ah radiallahu ta'ala anhu and then beat him. He pinned him. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, well, you have a point. And so then Samura bin Jundub was allowed to come as well. فَأَجَازَهُ So you see also the eagerness and the enthusiastic of the young men. Now, the next thing that happens at this particular time is that right before the battle starts, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, he takes out, so he takes out a sword. And the Prophet ﷺ says, مَن يَأْخُذُ هَذَا سَيْفِ بِحَقِّهِ مَن يَأْخُذ هَذَا سَيْفِ بِحَقِّهِ Who will take this sword from me and then fulfill the rights of this sword here today? So the narrations, they say that many people stood up and approached the Prophet ﷺ. Some of the narrations even say that some individual sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ for the sword, like Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu and others said, give it to me, O Messenger of Allah, give it to me. And the Prophet ﷺ didn't give it to anyone, he didn't hand it to anyone. And somebody asked the Prophet of Allah ﷺ that what is the right of this sword? مَا حَقُّهُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ The Prophet ﷺ said, أَن تَضْرِبَ بِهِ فِي الْعَدُوِ حَتَّى يَنْحَنِيَا that you go and you fight with the sword so fiercely till you bend the sword. So the Prophet wasallam, you know, and, and at that time when the Prophet wasallam said that you have to fulfill the right of this sword, فَأَحْجَمَ الْقَوْمِ Many people, they kind of backed off. Because they understood that um, this is a huge responsibility. This is the sword of the Prophet wasallam, and the expectations that come with it. So at that time, Abu Dujana radiallahu ta'ala anhu, whose name was Samak, Abu Dujana radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he stood up and he said, Ana akhudu bi haqqihi ya Rasulullah. I will take the sword and I will fulfill the rights of the sword of Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so at that time, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him the sword. And Abu Dujana radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Ibn Ishaq writes about him, that who was this man? That he was from amongst the Ansar, he was from, the, uh, from amongst the Ansar, and he actually was a very known fighter and warrior. Arab, That he was basically considered a source of pride to whichever side that he belonged on. And specifically, it's actually mentioned about him 
that one of the things that he would do is that when he would go out to battle is that he had like a red uh, bandana. He had a red bandana and when he would go out into battle, he would tie the red bandana on his head. He would tie it around his head. And whenever he would do this, people knew that this was a sign of the fact that Abu Dujana is going to fight. Some of the narrations mentioned that when the Ansar, when they saw Abu Dujana take the sword, and then he took out his red bandana and he um, tied it on his head, then the Ansar basically said that, هَذِهِ عَصَبَةُ qital, That this is the bandana of death. Right? So they said that Abu Dujana is about to go and fight. And Abu Dujana, his style basically was that when he would go into the battlefield, he would, you know, kind of, he would just tear through the lines. And he would just wreak havoc on the army. And so the Prophet of Allah وسلم, when he saw Abu Dujana racing back and forth into the battlefield, and the way he was walking, and he had a certain kind of strut, a certain type of confidence that he had to him when he walked, almost kind of, you know, not to accuse him of this, but almost kind of bordering on like arrogance. He was very boastful in his walk. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even commented when he saw him walking, he said, إِنَّهَا لَمِشْيَةٌ يُبْغِدُهَا اللَّهُ إِلَّا فِي مِثْلِ هَذَا الْمَوْطُنِ That this is a type of walk that normally Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala does not like, Allah is displeased with this type of walk except in the battlefield. It is acceptable in the battlefield. Because that is the time to basically exert one's will over the will of the enemy. And so Abu Dujana basically, um, you know, he started going back and forth in the battlefield. And the narrations even talk about the fact that he tore through, that when the um, Ibn Ishaq says, that when فَقْتَتَلَ النَّاسُ حَتَّى حَمِيَةِ الْحَرْبِ When the battle became very intense and very heated, قَاتَلَ أَبُو دُجَانَ حَتَّى أَمَعَنَ فِي النَّاسِ he fought until he tore through the enemy side and started to push people back from there, single-handedly. Zubair ibn al-Awam, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the relative of the Prophet ﷺ, and also one of the Quraysh, he says that, Ibn Hisham relates this, that, وَجَدْتُ فِي نَفْسِي حِينَ سَأَلْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم a safe, فَمَنَعَنِيهِ وَأَعْطَاهُ أَبُو دُجَانَ I felt kind of bad, because I had asked the Prophet ﷺ for the sword, and he didn't give it to me, and he gave it to Abu Dujana. So I felt bad. So, and I started thinking to myself, Ana ibn Safiya ammatihi wa min Quraysh. I am the cousin of the Prophet. My mother is the aunt of the Prophet Safiya, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And I went to him and I asked him, but he didn't give it to me. He gave it to Abu Dujana and left me. Wa tarakani, he didn't give it to me. Wallahi la anduranna ila ma yasna. I'm gonna see what Abu Dujana actually does with this. So he said, I was kind of following him. I was following him around the battlefield and when he took out his red bandana and he tied this to his head, the Ansar said, Akhraja Abu Dujana Isabat al Maut. Then now Abu Dujana has put on the handkerchief like the the, the bandana of death. Um, and he was saying, Abu Dujana was saying in the battlefield, Analadi Ahadani Khalili. وَنَحْنُ بِالسَّفْحِ لَدَيْ النَّخِيلِ أَلَّا أَقُومَ الدَّهْرَ فِي الْكَيُّولِ أَضْرِبْ بِسَيْفِ اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ That he was saying that I have made a promise to my friend, my best friend, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we live amongst the date palms with the messenger. We are blessed to live amongst the date palms with the messenger. And I have made an oath, I have taken an oath, that I will not stand at the back of the army, that I won't hide behind the back row of the army, but rather I will go forward and I will fight with the sword of God and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And another narration also mentions about Abu Dujana that there was a man amongst the mushrikun, very fierce warrior, and he was going through just tearing Muslims down, just tearing Muslims down with his sword, single-handedly. So Abu Dujana spotted him and started to move towards him. And the Sahabi who narrates this, he says, فَدَعَوْتُ اللَّهَ أَنْ يَجْمَعَ بَيْنَهُمَا I started making dua that I wanted to see these two people fight. <laughs> I don't want to see what happens. Um, فَالْتَقِيَا So when they met finally, the first one to strike was the mushrik. The man from Quraysh. He tried to hit Abu Dujana and Abu Dujana deflected his strike with his shield. 
And then Abu Dujana basically struck him with his sword and in a single shot, he killed him. In, an, uh, in another narration, it also mentions that Ka'ab bin Malik, Ka'ab bin Malik radiallahu ta'ala anhu also says, that kuntu fi man juriha min al-muslimin. I was amongst the people who was injured on the day of Uhud. So again, I, he similarly relates a similar story. He says that I saw a man, a fierce warrior on the side of the Quraysh, fighting so fiercely, he was wearing this big huge armor, and he was just tearing through Muslims, disposing of one after another after another. And he was screaming while he was tearing down Muslims, he was screaming that, um, come at me, so that I can gut you like animals are gutted. Right? Istawsiqu kama istawsaqad jazaru an al ghanam. Let me gut you like people gut animals. You know, after you sacrifice an animal and you split the animal open and take the internal organs out, cleaning up the this, the animal. So he said, let me gut you like people gut their 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 kill when they go hunt like an animal. So he was doing this and. You know, some of the people of the... Uh, and then I, he says that, I saw a man from amongst the Muslims stand up and start to stare at him. Just wreaking havoc on the Muslim side of the army. So, and he started moving towards him. And he was also wearing an armor. This Muslim man was also wearing an armor. And he started moving towards him. So he says, from to I was injured, so I was on the ground. But then I moved, hatta kuntu min warahi. So I moved over to the side a little bit, so that I could see them. Thumma kumtu aqdurul muslima wal kafira bi basari. And then I stood up, even though I was injured, I stood up so that I could see what would happen. Right? And when the and he says that the 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 mushrik was actually afdalu huma uddatan wa hayatan. The mushrik was actually larger than the Muslim, looked more physically stronger and imposing than the Muslim, and was more better armed and equipped than the Muslim was, who went to go fight this mushrik. And he says that I kept staring at both of them until they finally met. And the Muslim walked up to the mushrik, and this part is kind of, you know, graphic, but I mean it's battle. He says that he basically put his sword into the shoulder of the mushrik and took his sword all the way down till he like cut him in two. وَتَفَرَّقَ فِرْقَتَيْنِ And then the Muslim, after he disposed of this guy who was just wreaking havoc on the army, he uncovered his face and he looked back at me. ثُمَّ كَشَفَ الْمُسْلِمُ عَنْ وَجِهِ وَقَالَ كَيْفَ تَرَى يَا كَعْبِ أَنَا أَبُو دُجَانَ so he said he turned around and he saw me staring the whole time and I was just mesmerized and he said, what do you think of that? Ya Ka'ab, my name's Abu Dujana by the way. <laughs> right? So it's kind of like, you know, you sign something for somebody, like here, keep the ball, let me sign this for you, you keep it, right? So it, this was kind of the courage and the bravery of Abu Dujana on that particular day and it also goes to, you know, on a more serious note, now again, this is talking about battles and this oftentimes becomes a controversial, you know, people perceive it to be a controversial topic or whatever, it's a part of history. It's a part, a part of the history of any nation or any community that was oppressed, that had to fight to survive and fight to seek out their rights and in, in, in their, their, decent, their respect, in their autonomy. And you know, so in their dignity. And so this shows you that the Prophet ﷺ gave Abu Dujana a sword because the Prophet ﷺ understood people's talents. And he was aware of what people were capable of. And he was able to see deeper into people and recognize people of what people could achieve and what their potential was. Now, there's a similar, um, another story about another individual um, that also is mentioned that another man came to the Prophet ﷺ while he was fighting and he فَسَأَلَهُ سَيْفًا يُقَاتِلْ بِهِ And he asked the Prophet ﷺ, please give me a sword that I can fight with. And the Prophet ﷺ, لَعَلَّكَ إِنْ عَطَيْتُكَ تُقَاتِلْ فِي الْكَيُّلْ If I give you the sword, are you gonna go to the back of the army and hide out then? Oh, I got the Prophet ﷺ's sword, good souvenir, let me go hide out till this is all over. Is that what you're going to do? And he said, لا فَأَعْطَاهُ سَيْفًا He said, no, I promise I won't. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him a sword. فَجَعَلَ يَرْتَجِزُ وَيَقُولُ Then he went out into the battlefield fighting and he was saying, أَنَا الَّذِي عَاهَدَنِي خَلِيلِي أَلَّا أَقُومَ الدَّهْرَ فِي الْكَيُّولِ That he was saying that I have made a promise to my best friend Muhammad ﷺ that I will not go and hide in the back of the army. 
But before I conclude here today, when we talk about the story of Abu Dujana, and again, if somebody kind of heard this on the surface, they would hear this and they would kind of say like, look, you know, this is what you people idolize, and you know, this warrior with this red bandana on, and re or red face mask on, and just, you know, cutting people up, and bragging about it, and all this kind of stuff. It, it, something very fascinating occurred with Abu Dujana. Remember the story that I told you, I purposely skipped over this, because I wanted to talk about this, uh, as a conclusion, the story I told you about was where um, the mushrik who was basically going through just tearing Muslims down and kind of, you know, calling people on. Um, and Abu Dujana went up to him and basically, you know, and the man struck him and Abu Dujana deflected it with the shield and then he killed the guy. Abu Dujana says, Abu Dujana says that he relates the same story himself. Ibn Ishaq relates this. And he says that, or in the first one, the, the, the Sahabi who's narrating it also makes mention of this. And Abu Dujana personally also relates this. So the Sahabi says, um, After Abu Dujana killed that guy, That then I saw Abu Dujana turned, and he had his sword right above the head of Hind bint Utbah. This is the daughter of Utbah who was killed at Badr. And she is the wife of Abu Sufyan. And she was actually one of the leaders of the Mushrik army that came to kill the Muslims and burn Medina to the ground. And in fact, it's mentioned about her as well that she was actually out there in the battlefield, in the front of even the battlefield, inciting the Mushrik army, the Meccan army, to kill Muslims. She was saying that, إِن تُقْبِلُوا نُعَانِقْ وَنَفْرِشُ النَّمَارِقْ أَوْ تُدْبِلُوا نُفَارِقْ فِرَاقَ غَيْرِ وَامِقْ She was saying that if you go and you fight, then we will embrace you, and we will greet you, and we will basically, um, you know, you know, serve you and, uh, and honor you. And she said, but if you run away from the army like a coward, if you run away from the battle like a coward, you turn your backs and you run, then we will leave you. We will leave you without even thinking about it. We'll leave you faster than the arrow leaves the bow. غير وامق. Alright? So she was out there inciting and instigating. She's every much as part of the battle as that warrior was that Abu Dujana just took down. So the man says, I saw Abu Dujana, he had his sword right above Hind's head, the woman's head, and then he turned the sword away from her. Abu Dujana himself says, رَأَيْتُ insanan يُحْمِشُ nasa hamshan." He says himself that, I saw a human being, kind of maybe covered up, alright, um, who was inciting people on and was kind of like leading the charge. Hamshan shadidan, فَصَمَتُّ لَهُ So I went in the direction of that person to basically take care of this person. فَلَمَّا حَمَلْتُ عَلَيْهِ سَيْفْ وَالْوَلَى When I picked my sword up upon that person to take that person down, that person kind of quivered or kind of whimpered. وَالْوَلَى Made like a whimpering type of like scared sound. فَإِذَا إِمْرَأَةٌ it was a woman. I looked closer, it was covered up, you know, with an armor or a helmet or whatever. And I looked closer and it was a woman. فَأَكْرَمْتُ سَيْفَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ أَنْ أَضْرِبَ بِهِ إِمْرَأَةً So I thought that I should honor the sword of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم by not striking a woman with that sword. Meaning to, in Arabic, in, in, as a literal translation comes out kind of awkwardly, he said that, I realized at that time that striking a woman, even in the battlefield, even if she's got armor on, even if she's in the battlefield, and she's leading the charge, and inside, you know, encouraging and pushing the soldiers for leading the charge, even then, to strike a woman would have been dishonoring and disrespecting the sword of the Prophet ﷺ. This is not my sword, this was the messenger's sword. And I would have disrespected the sword of the Prophet ﷺ had I struck a woman with the sword. Now, you gotta understand something, right? He's not making this up from himself. Where did this idea come to him? The Prophet ﷺ is saying, I want you to fight with this sword till you bend it. I want you to fight with this sword till you bend it, till it's worn out. Go. 
I want you to not go and hide in the back of the army. I need you to be out there today. Protect our people. But then where is he getting this idea that I can't strike a woman? If I strike a woman, this would be disrespectful to my religion. This would be disrespectful to my messenger. This would be disrespectful to the sword that the messenger put in my hand. This idea is of course coming from the fact that the Prophet ﷺ told them. And there are numerous ahadith, authentic narrations, that the Prophet ﷺ forbade them from striking down women and children. So there were ethics. And there was discipline. Remember the discipline I spoke about. I spoke about. That the battle will get heated. It'll get very intense. Your world will feel like it's spinning. But you never lose control. You never lose your dignity. You never lose your stability. You never lose your sanity and your decency. We are people of ethics and people of morality. And even when situations become tough, and we have to make very difficult decisions and do very difficult things. We are still a people of a code. We have a code that we operate by. And it's a moral, ethical, divine, prophetic code. And so that's what the Prophet of Allah taught them. And you see this warrior, right? The red bandana, the red face mask, whatever. Tearing through people, tearing through the army single-handedly, taking down their biggest and their meanest, nastiest. Right? But still, such discipline was instilled in him. And look who, in whose hand, the Prophet ﷺ puts the sword, because he knows that he's going to now represent me. And that again shows you that the Prophet ﷺ invested into people. And he taught people, and trained people, and mentored people, and then put them out to do the task that, that needed to be done. Because then he could trust that they wouldn't, you know, misrepresent him. And that they would always come, conduct themselves by, that, by those ethics and that morality that was taught to them. So inshallah, we'll go ahead and pause here. In the next session, we'll continue in the Battle of Uhud and talk about some of the key incidents and individuals in the Battle of Uhud, like Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, Hamza radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We'll talk about Musa bin Umayr radiallahu ta'ala anhu and others as well. And we'll also talk about the injuries to the Prophet ﷺ and kind of what happened and how the battle turned and other things, inshallah. So we'll cover all of that in the next session. Bi'nilahi ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك